Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll be going through one of our webinar series events, Healthy Soil for a Healthy Planet. This is the first webinar of Understanding Soil Health. I see some folks are loading in already to join us. Let's go to the next slide there, Brian. So just to give you uh, an orientation to some of our uh, webinar um, guidelines, uh, you're all going to be muted for the duration of the webinar so that the panelists can interact with each other without any kind of sound glitches. Um, we do invite you to enter your questions for the panelists in the Q&A section uh, of the um, Zoom links. And so um, we'll get a little bit more into exactly where that is um, in, in a couple of minutes. And I see that people are already filling in per our usual question um, that in chat you would tell us where you're joining from. I'm seeing places like Brazil and Puget Sound and Switzerland coming up. So this is exciting for us to have people joining from all over the world. Feel free to converse with other attendees in the chat and, um, and remember that you, you can uh, ask your questions of the panelists directly in the Q&A section. It looks like we've already got Hundreds of participants, that's great. Could we go to the next slide, please, Brian? So uh, again, just to, to let you know how the rundown of today's um, webinar will work, we're gonna make some introductions here uh, for a few minutes. Uh, we'll get to all of our panelists today, and then uh, I'll give you some uh, working definitions of soil health that Dr. Ingham and I have, have chatted about, as well as defining some of the benefits to farmers uh, if they'll um, restore their soil health and manage that properly. And then we have uh, Dee Dee here to give us some of the, um, some information about benefits to the planet. Uh, so soil health can extend out to, to having a lot of environmental uh, benefits and she'll cover those. And then we also have uh, Dan and Stephen here to talk about benefits to human health. Uh, we'll follow that with a, a Q&A session for 45 minutes. So a total time of just under two hours today. Let's go to the next slide, please. All right. So uh, we're going to go around the horn here and let the panelists introduce themselves, starting with uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham. Oh, Elaine, you're, you're muted. Okay, yeah, that was a surprise. Okay, I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham, and uh, I uh, lead the Soil Food Web School. Uh, most of you probably know many of my publications in the scientific literature, uh, well over 80, 85 um, papers in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, Oh boy, I love it. This uh, this is what happens when you get to be 80 years old or 70 years old. Jeez, can't even get the numbers right. So um, uh, publications in the scientific literature, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work and it's uh, uh, much of it's been published. But here at the school, we're continuing to do research and we will be um, writing that um, data into the uh, manuals and into the information that people learn when they come to get um, the education here in the foundation courses, learning how to use a microscope, um, becoming a, um, a laboratory that you do samples for other people, or you become a consultant where you're, you're doing um, interpretations of what that biology is or should be for maximum health in your in your school, in your, um, in your fields. Thanks so much, Elaine. Um, I'm Dr. Adam Cobb. Uh, again, I'll be uh, sort of running the, the MC portion of today or, or being the host of the webinar. Um, I joined the Soul Food Web School uh, just about seven months ago now, and uh, I do a lot of uh, work in the background as a content creator and also um, some of the work in the foreground as a science communicator here at the school. So that's just a little bit about me. And then uh, uh, we'll have um, Dee Dee, who's with the Land and Leadership Initiative, um, explain a little bit more of, of her background. 
And Didi, you're muted yes. as well. <laughs> okay. Um, I am the author of two books. One is called The Ecology of Care, Medicine, Agriculture, Money, and the Quiet Power of Human and Microbial Communities. And the second book is called Understanding Soil Health and Watershed Function. And that is a free download at landandleadership.org. Uh, and I um, teach a lot online, including through the Soil Food Web School. And um, I, uh, the, one of the most exciting in which we um, have really deep discussions and design, design for regenerative projects. Not so much the, not so much the nuts and bolts of how to make healthy soil. That's Elaine's job, <laughs> but um, but more thinking about the entire system thinking about the economic system, the education system, social systems, and how those, how we need to work with those to get everything going in the right direction. The other project is the Andhra Pradesh Community Managed Natural Farming Initiative in India that is engaging uh, close to 800,000 farmers in one state in regenerating healthy soil. And I'll show a little mini video if we have time about that at the end. Uh, over to you, Dan. Hi, um, <clears throat> glad to be here. My name is Dan Kittredge. I'm the founder and executive director of the Bionutrient Food Association. We're about a little more than 10 years old now, nonprofit, um, focusing on increasing quality in the food supply. And by quality, we mean flavor, aroma, nutritive value, health giving attribute, which we are fairly certain connects to soil health and plant health and human health and farm viability and <laughs> all kinds of cultural health. Um, we've been working for the past five years on a research project to sort of define those nutrient variations in food to um, connect them through a really broad and thoughtful uh, open source data framework to management practices and soil health. Um, and as well to build a, um, you know, instrumentation so people can assess that nutrient variation. We think that there's a strong connection, um, like I said, between nutritional value of food and soil health and environmental health and human health. And so we think that's a, that's a spot where a lot of people can engage who aren't necessarily growing themselves. So I'll be talking a little bit about our work here today um, and very excited to introduce Stefan, um, our partner in our beef, beef project for that work um, to this community. I think he'll really be impressed with what he's doing. And speaking I, I, of that, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just about to say, and speaking of that, Stefan, we'd like you to introduce yourself, please. Great. Yes. Hi, all. My name is uh, Dr. Stefan van Vliet. I'm a uh, Nutrition scientist with the metabolomics expertise in the Center for Human Nutrition Studies at the Utah State University. Um, I wrote my PhD in kinesiology and community health as an assistant fellow and uh, received uh, training at the Washington University School of Medicine and the Duke University School of Medicine. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, linking agricultural production and soil health, plant animal health to human health. Uh, so a lot of our work is performed at the nexus of agriculture and human health. Uh, we're collaborating with, with farmers, ecologists, agricultural scientists uh, to study these critical linkages between uh, the nutrient density of our food, the production, and human health. And uh, that is in a nutshell what, uh, what I'll do. And, uh, and we'll present on our uh, Beef Nutrient Density Project with uh, uh, Dan Kittredge and the Bionutrient Institute. Thank you so much. And, and last but not least, uh, we have uh, Brian Vag here, um, with, uh, who's one of our consultants at the Soil Food Web School. And um, Brian, would you give the audience a little information about yourself? Sure. I'm Brian Bagg. Um, I own a company called Sprouting Soil based out of Oregon. And as uh, Adam mentioned, I am a soil food web consultant and also a mentor for the Soil Food Web School. And really, you know, uh, my role is to, to help uh, transition uh, predominantly agriculture, but other growing systems like landscaping and golf courses and parks and things like that. But uh, helping those folks in those growing systems transition from either conventional, conventional organic into growing with biology. Uh, and it's definitely, um, I'd say in the last uh, two years, at least, it is really accelerated. Uh, there's a lot of challenges that farmers are facing, and um, we have a lot of answers for them. So it's, it's uh, a good time to be in the soil biology consulting business, that's for sure. That sounds great. Now, um, uh, if we could go to the next slide here. We're going to do a quick poll, which will pop up for all of our participants. Yes, we're just going to ask that you um, let us know if you're visiting us here today as a farmer, 
grower or ag professional, as an environmental advocate, or if you consider yourself both of the above or neither of the above. So we already see that there are some answers coming in. Looks like we have a fair mix of folks. You can take us to the next slide as well, please, Brian. All right. And then this is just one more uh, reminder that we're asking you to add, um, add Q &A, or your questions to the Q&A tab um, so that um, in our Q&A session at the end, after we've done the presentations, um, we'll be able to pull those over and, and answer your questions for you. All right, let's get started. Um, as I mentioned, the first part of the uh, webinar today is gonna really be about defining soil health as well as um, explaining some of the benefits uh, to farmers and growers. And that's going to be a bit of a team effort between Dr. Elaine and myself. So um, as I was asked to come join the webinar today by the team, I, I really took some time to survey the literature and, and um, ask a lot of my friends who are working across academia and, and government what they define soil health as. And in my opinion, there's not one true, great, perfect definition for soil health out there. Um, most often we see something to the effect of the ability to, of soil to act as a living ecosystem and supply the nutrient needs of plants and animals and humans. Uh, so I actually wanted to go a little bit more into a metaphor today uh, and set the stage for our discussion. So I like to think of the human body and human health, which is something that we're all um, intimately familiar with, uh, and, and the ways in which soil health is like human health. Uh, the first way is we are really holistic beings that the, the, even though you can look at the human body and consider different organs and different functions within the human body, it's a whole well-being, uh, not just somebody hanging on by a thread as, a, as technically alive, but, but truly thriving is about a holistic connection and, um, and health across the entire human body. Uh, now with point two here, uh, just like with the human body, soil has these different diagnosable indicators. So if you go to the doctor, they're gonna check your blood pressure, your pulse, your breathing, those are indicators of health. And we can start to see now, um, if something's not quite aligning with the normal range, that tells your doctor that they need to do some diagnosing to dig down and find the, the root of the problem. But we all know that modern medicine can sometimes just mask the symptoms of what people are facing when they're unwell. And in the same way, um, we'll talk about how many of the agricultural uh, practices that are used in industry are just masking symptoms that are happening when the soil system is not fully healthy. And so um, the final point I'd like to make is about the microorganisms, because this is similar between uh, soil health and human health as well, that we're finding more every day. There's more literature being published about how important the human microbiome is to our health. Um, I actually was reading a paper recently that uh, tracked populations, aging populations, and found that there was a connection between their, the, the microorganisms in their gut and their sense of loneliness, right? So if you need a boost to your, to your mental well-being, your microorganisms may play a role in that. And um, really, microorganisms are, are the key to soil health. If we're, uh, we'll, we'll go into this in a little more detail um, as, we, as we move along. If you could take us to the next slide there, Brian, please. So one of the key indicators that we do wanna make sure to talk about is soil organic matter. And um, I mean, as a scientist, I'm not supposed to use the word magic, but if there's magical, uh, a magical component of soil, to me, it's, it's the soil organic matter. And um, that's partially because it serves as a food source for bacteria and fungi. 
uh, and bacteria and fungi consuming organic matter as well as, as minerals in the soil and taking them into their bodies is one of the basic functions of the soil food web. Um, of course, those, those nutrients are released um, as the bacteria and fungi are consumed by um, uh, organisms across the, the soil food web. Uh, so it's an important uh, food source for, for the base of the food web. Uh, soil organic matter also can play a very direct role in improving chemical, physical, and other biological processes in the soil. Uh, so let me give you an example there of chemical. Um, greater organic matter content in the soil tends to keep the pH of the soil more stable. That's a, a very basic chemical indicator that um, it's almost always tested by soil testing labs. And we see, uh, you know, sometimes we use the word the, a buffer that a lot of soil organic matter um, can keep that um, pH from moving too high or too low, right, uh, through seasonal changes. Additionally, there are physical characteristics of the soil, uh, such as, uh, for lack of a better word, the fluffiness of the soil, the tilth. Uh, you can pick it up with your hands and you can get scoops of it with your hands and more organic matter tends to, to create better physical characteristics in the soil like that. And then in addition to uh, the, the food source for bacteria and fungi that would be a part of the biological processes in soil, uh, soil organic matter uh, uh, tends to improve things like the infiltration of water and air into the soil system and tends to uh, provide little habitats for different organisms to um, connect with. To, they, they'll, we'll see uh, hunting, uh, organisms that are predators actually hunting in soil aggregates uh, near organic chunks of organic matter in the soil. And so they, it has a, a wide range of effects on, a positive effects on biological processes in the soil. And Dr. Elaine and I talked about this just the other day, um, you know, in our foundation courses, she mentions that you really want at least 3% soil organic matter uh, just to serve that basic function of food for your microorganisms. But really, you could go up to 100% soil organic matter. Plants grow very well in, you know, if you could have a, a deep garden bed that went two meters deep and it was just full of compost. Your, your plants could theoretically grow very well in that if the compost was biocomplete and, and the organisms and other, and other components were there. So soil organic matter is just one of the, the key indicators. It's like a heartbeat or a blood pressure reading for the soil. You could take us to the next slide, please. So I'm going to ask um, Dr. Elaine to, to speak on this in just a moment, but I wanted to ask this question uh, so that we can all think through if you were actually to ask yourself the question from looking out at a field that you pass in your in your car and you said is that soil dying or thriving is that soil degrading or is it improving the soil health over time it's really the soil food web that's going to give us the answer so we'll go to the next slide and, and have dr elaine explain a little bit about the soil food web. Unmute myself. All right. So when we look at the soil food web, would, you know, this is the web that we talk about all the time in the position of different organisms in this food web. It's a web because it's not a single straight line through. Uh, we always think of uh, above ground is it's, um, you know, bunny rabbits are eaten by foxes, are eaten by, you know, whatever the next bigger predator, and that's the food web. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the straight chain, the food chain is where you only have one uh, group of organisms occupying each stage in that um, successional system or um, um, food chain. When in fact, when we look at soil and above ground, it's a web that we should be talking about. 
So, you know, sunlight energy has to be fixed and that process occurs through photosynthesis. Um, uh, just as Al Adam said, um, we uh, don't tend to like to use that term magical when we're scientists, but if you wanna talk about a magical um, uh, an occurrence going on all the time, it's the process of taking sunlight energy and being able to store it through the process of photosynthesis. So fixing carbon, taking a carbon dioxide molecule from the atmosphere and um, removing the hydrogens um, and the, and the uh, air, oxygen, uh, and getting the carbon chain started. It's that connection between the first carbon chain and the second one and the third one the fourth carbon dioxide, the fifth carbon dioxide, pulling, uh, holding that energy in that bond. And now we have energy that can be used through the whole rest of this food web. Well, you know, think about your plant. It's now got the energy that it needs to run everything. But in order to stay alive, you have to grow, um, be able to pull all the other nutrients into your body. And the cells of grasses are not that different from cells of fungi or cells of microarthropods or cells of human beings. We all require more or less the same amounts of nutrients. And where is your plant going to get that? And I always have to know the mechanism. It doesn't work, you know, I'm just going to put my um, plant in the soil and it's going to magically start growing. Uh, well, why do some plants not grow? Uh, you have to understand the mechanisms going on in your soil. If you can't, if you can't figure out the mechanisms by which the plants are getting the nutrients or getting protection or uh, holding water in the soil, um, fixing um, compaction problems, if you can't figure out how to do that work, who is it in here? that does all of the particular jobs, you're not gonna be successful. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know what these organisms are present in order to do the jobs they're supposed to perform. And so that's kind of been my career is putting all of this together. So energy from the above ground part of the plant, but the plant, has to get nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and magnesium and calcium and sodium and potassium and iron and zinc and oh yeah some water and some oxygen and so your plant is putting that root system down into the soil in order to get those nutrients but those nutrients are tied up in plant not available forms in the sand the silt the clay if you look at rocks, pebbles, uh, parent material, boulders, things like that, those uh, are all the precursors to sand, silt, and clay. Well, how do you break down the uh, big boulders, the pebbles, the rocks? How do you break that down into something that a bacterium or a fungus could approach and pull the nutrients out of the silica bilayer in the sand, silt, and clay? How how do you convert parent material into sand, silt, and clay? Well, most people would say, uh, oh, it's weathering. It's freeze, thaw, wet, dry cycles. And those are insignificant amounts of breakdown of the rocks, of the boulders into something, into sand, silt, and clay. Because the, what does the greatest amount of breakdown of those inorganic nutrients, not available nutrients, are the bacteria and the fungi. So right away, we're looking at bacteria. I hope you can all see my pointer. Um, the fungi are right above it in that um, uh, second trophic level, if you will. So the plant is actually putting out sugars proteins and carbohydrates, high carbon containing materials, and using that as food to get the bacteria and fungi growing. The plant will actually put out a specific um, exudate when it needs calcium or when it needs potassium or when it needs, it's, it's a message 
to the bacteria and the fungi here that there's those bacteria and fungi better start growing. Here's some food to get you growing, but make the enzymes to pull those nutrients that the plant requires from a plant unavailable source, such as in soil organic matter. Most of the nutrients in soil organic matter are not available to your plant. Your plant can't take them up. Sand, silt, and clay, plant can't take up those um, nutrients. You've got to have the fungi and the bacteria doing the next step of using their enzymes to pull those nutrients from the um, organic matter, pull, pulling that out and storing those nutrients in the bacteria and the fungi. And where do most of the bacteria and fungi grow in your soil? <laughs> well, right around the source of their food right in the root system of your plants. Yep, these organisms will also be carried above ground to protect the above ground parts of your plants. And so there's an, another whole set of information that we have to know and understand. So bacteria and fungi are holding these nutrients in their bodies, but they're in plant not available forms. They're organic matter, but they're not available to the plants. So the next step has to happen. The bacteria have to be eaten by the protozoa or by bacterial feeding nematodes. The fungi have to be eaten by uh, microarthropods or fungal feeding nematodes. So that when these organisms consume their prey, the concentration of nutrients inside the fungi or inside the bacteria is so much greater, so much more than their predators require. That these predators are gonna either spit out or poop, here we go, here's the poop loop, the, the, um, the poop that they produce is the, exactly the form of nutrient that your plant can take up. And so as the bacteria and fungi are eaten by their predators, the nutrients for your plants are released right there next to the root system. No need for diffusion to be pulling things from, you know, feet away. A system, an operating soil food web is going to deliver those nutrients to the surface of the roots. It's kind of like the pizza delivery guy. You know, when you want a pizza, you call up the pizza house and you say, I want a cheese pizza with pepperoni on it. Um, and the, at the root at the other end says, um, OK, uh, you know, we're, we're going to um, send out the um, uh, delivery guy to pick up those nutrients, uh, make those nutrients available. Um, in the shop, yep, okay, we've got to make those things into plant available nutrients. And then here comes the pizza delivery boy comes back and delivers the pizza right there at the surface of that root system. So this whole system operating together to be able to feed your plant at the time and, uh, you know, the, and I always think of it as these processes are going on every second of every day through the whole growing season for your plants, making available to the plant precisely what it needs because the plant can tell the bacteria and fungi what it needs and the enzymes they're supposed to make. And so if you are destroying your fungi, if you're destroying the beneficial bacteria and fungi, nematodes, microarthropods, protozoa, your plant's gonna be in a lot of, of um, pain. You're not gonna be able to get all the nutrients into that plant that it requires to prevent diseases from attacking it. The immune system in a plant is very dependent on the nutrients that the plant is getting. Well, human beings are exactly the same. If you're not getting the nutrients that are needed to uh, attack and consume all the bad guys you know, getting breathed in or that you might be eating on your food surfaces, if you don't have the nutrients to build your immune system, you're going to be very susceptible. So as human beings, so like plants, or is it so plants, so are the human beings. We're shared systems because 
Mother Nature found systems that worked. And then she repeats them over and over and over again in various places. So when we're looking at this food web, protozoa, bacterial feeders, nematodes that are bacterial feeders, nematodes that are fungal feeders, microarthropods, um, are, you can understand the, uh, their need, why they have to be there. But why do we need higher level predators? Because if something wasn't controlling the arthropods, the nematodes, the protozoa, and preventing their numbers from getting too concentrated, which means then they would overeat and wipe out most of the fungi and the bacteria and your plant wouldn't get the nutrients that it requires as rapidly as it needs them. So something's got to maintain the balance. And so protozoa, um, um, uh, the microarthropods, the predatory nematodes, the nematodes that eat these other guys, yes, there are can cannibals in the soil uh, because these nematodes eat those nematodes. Well, what keeps the, these macroarthropods macro and the predatory nematodes, what keeps them in check? Well, you have to have the next layer in the food web and the next and the next. So who's at the top of the food chain? At the top of the food web, more correctly, right? It's human beings. We're here to make certain that this is all functioning the way it should. And instead, what we've been doing is destroying all of these organisms in the soil with the toxic chemicals that we use. Inorganic fertilizers, they all kill these organisms. Too high a concentration. The, the levels of um, inorganic fertilizers we're putting out is killing all of this biology. And then you can't get the root systems to grow down deep into the soil because it is the microorganisms that produce the aggregates. Without the bacteria and without the fungi, without the higher level guys here building airways and passageways, and even these guys building airways and passageways, um, we wouldn't be able to get oxygen down into the soil. Water wouldn't infiltrate. You would have erosion. Most of your soil would be washing away into the rivers and lakes and streams and the oceans. Oh, wait a minute. That's exactly what we've done. Well, As thanks we've so much for for bringing that part up, Elaine, because I, I want to um, move us forward on the slide just for the sake of time here, because we've, we've got to get to all of those benefits that are that are coming up. And just, you know, one example that you brought up that's so critical is the way that fungi can help us build that soil structure directly. And um, I've, I've put in just a little plug for Merlin Sheldrake as well here. Um, in his book, because we recently had him at our soil summit um, in a panel, and it was a lot of fun to see. We called it the mycology mind melt, um, just to go over all the benefits of this one group of microorganisms in the soil. Um, but let me uh, progress the slide here again and mention the range of benefits, you know, starting just with, again, that idea of wellness that we have a, a holistic soil ecosystem and that improving that entire ecosystem is our goal. It's why we um, work on restoring anything that's missing from the soil food web. As Dr. Elaine has explained, each organism has a purpose and it would be complete folly of us to assume that none of them is needed in the soil ecosystem. So working with nature is a good investment. Take Having our growers and our um, gardeners, our farmers and ranchers, uh, our land managers, uh, make the investment to get anything that's missing from the soil food web right back into there. Um, you know, this is the way that we have a, a healthy functioning, uh, complete ecosystem. So to dive into a more specific example, Brian, if you'd take us forward on to the next slide, what we see a lot of times is that every day, food producers are waking up and thinking, what do I have to fight and kill today? What pest, what weed, what insect, what other problem am I gonna have to tackle today? And in reality, these agrochemicals that are being employed so often to solve these problems are just creating more problems. As Dr. Lane mentioned, they're wiping something out of the soil food web so that the system becomes unbalanced and un incapable of, of maintaining its own processes. 
So when we focus on soil health and when we put the soil food web at the center, we can eliminate the use of these harmful substances and actually see that pests, weeds, insects, and other problems diminish over time as we transition that land. And Brian, if you take us forward to the second example, um, everybody cares about yield. And in fact, uh, you know, we're all, uh, anybody who's involved in an agricultural business, they have to consider their production, their profits, uh, but longer term, not just every year making enough yields to keep the farm going, but longer term, this new, this new idea is arising everywhere in the agricultural sector of resilience, the ability of these systems to recover from stress, whether that's periodic drought uh, and extreme weather events. And so stabilizing the production uh, on the farm is one of the things that we can do without harmful chemicals if we have a complete soil food web. And our next example or benefit is that we can improve those profit margins, as I mentioned, but not just you know in the last maybe 50, 100 years of human history, it's, it's been sort of a game of saying, increase the yields, increase the yields. This is what most of the agronomists out there are researching. But today I'm really excited that we'll hear about food quality. You know, that's a huge function in terms of increasing that nutrient density of food so that the societal costs of poor human health uh, are tackled by the very food we eat. The food can be the medicine. And that's because these roots on our, on our crops will grow deeper. They'll get more access through the soil food web organisms to, to nutrients so that they can collect those nutrients into the food products that we consume. And the next slide talks about the soil sponge, which is a huge part of uh, what Didi talks about as well, that as we build that structure, our irrigation requirements can, can be reduced. And as Dr. Elaine mentioned, we can see a, a less of a problem with erosion over time because that water that falls into our food system soils will actually percolate into the soil. It will infiltrate and go to those deeper layers, uh, nourishing the, the life deeper and deeper into the soil instead of running off the field and taking uh, a bunch of, of eroded soil with it. And so this will lead us to our, our final example here, which is that we'll protect and build community life. And I mean that two ways. The, the life of the community of the soil food web will be protected with soil health uh, improvements, but also human community, right? That we can have these thriving microorganisms and through the services that they provide to plants, and the food ultimately, the quality of the food that's produced, we eventually arrive at healthy humans. Um, as, as Dr. Elaine said, the, the, we could think of ourselves as the top of the food web, but also um, I think of how the food web is this miracle that gives so much to us and, and we should be grateful uh, for that miracle. So if you'll take us to the next slide there, Brian. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the um, special, uh, we're calling it the springboard offer, uh, where anybody who is interested in taking our foundation, foundation courses can get a huge um, discount, which we guarantee will be the lowest price available for this package of courses uh, in uh, 2022, representing a total saving of 47%. We actually have a video that we're going to show um, just a brief three minute video about this offer. Spring is in the air, and there's never been a better time to launch your career in soil regeneration than right now. With the Springboard Plus offer, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses for just $2,900, and you'll get two free bonus courses saving an incredible $2,600 or 47% off the regular fee price. This is guaranteed to be the lowest price through the rest of the year. Whether you're a farmer, rancher, market gardener, or just someone who's passionate about the planet looking for a way to make a big impact, this could be for you. Here's what some of our students are saying about the Soil Food Web Training Program. 
I find that this information hasn't been taught to me and I had to get off my high horse. And even though I have a PhD, I feel like I'm totally undertrained. I feel like I'm learning more with this program than I have with in-person classes in the past. I've taken classes on microbiology before, but this course really makes a difference in the way that a story is put together that unveils the relationships between plants and all those beneficial organisms that we just cannot see without a microscope. If you're looking for something that does a deep dive into soil biology, this is it. It is just an incredible knowledge base and is really relevant to what's going on right now in the world. Without it, the only way I could have gained this knowledge would have been by dropping my life and going to graduate school. And that just wasn't realistic for me. But Soil Food Web has made it possible for me to build a meaningful career in land restoration. I was really nervous I was going to put quite a bit of money down and not get that bang for my buck. But once I actually got into the FC courses, I was incredibly impressed with how professional they are and actually the level of education you receive. This is the career path I've been looking for in the biological community and I was having trouble finding. Remember, with the Springboard Plus offer, you're not only getting the foundation courses for $2,900, but you're also getting these two free bonus courses. The Introduction to Permaculture is an 18 lecture course that covers a wide array of permaculture principles and themes delivered by Graham Bell, Chair of Permaculture Scotland and longest serving permaculture teacher in the UK with 31 years experience teaching on six continents. Permaculture is a regenerative design approach that can be applied to just about anything from water management, growing systems, dwellings, and much more. The Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop is delivered by educator and author Dee Dee Persaus. This five session course is all about regenerating the soil sponge for flood, drought, and wildfire resilience. It builds on the successes of innovative land managers around the world who are saving huge sums and damages from extreme weather events and crop diseases while restoring the dignity and profitability of farming. Didi teaches participatory workshops, both in person and online, helping to show the nested relationships between soil health, human health, water cycles, and climate resiliency. Sign up for these amazing courses and join the soil revolution today. Spring is in the air and there's never... Okay, so we're going to uh, actually switch gears a little bit here and hear from Dee Dee about the benefits to our planet of healthy soils. And she's got her own slide deck, so we'll turn that over to her. Great. Uh, that was exciting to listen to. And it was also, um, it's fun to read all what's going on in the chat. Those, are, those who are being distracted by the chat, you can open it up and it'll be a box and then you can drag it off to the side. Um, uh, cause I know sometimes you can't see a slide when it's going there. So, um, I am from the land and leadership initiative. And, and as you just saw, I'm, I'm also really excited to be teaching a course alongside the soil food web school, um, that, and I saw a question in there somewhere about how is a soil food web school building community. And one of the ways I do that is through this live five session course where we do a lots and lots of breakout discussions. So you'll get to know people from all around the world. Um, and that's fun for me as well. Um, okay. So, um, so we've, you've already typed some into the chat about where you are, but put that in again, along with what are you worried about? What effects are you already seeing of climate change and environmental de degradation? So go ahead and put that right into the chat, just um, whatever you are seeing. I know in Vermont, we've had horrendous flooding, um, lost hundreds of miles of roads and bridges. I'm seeing pests, erosion, increased drought, fire, uh, freaky weather, impacts on human health, missing food in the future, algae blooms, extreme weather events, birds dying. I can't even read these, it's going so fast. High winds, much less rain, storms, uh, yield drop, erosion, desertification. 
And then how about the social effects, social effects of environmental degradation? Uh, social, uh, yeah, in, in terms of biodiversity, right? Bees I saw in there, insects, um, abandoned pastures. Um, I know we have, a, there's a lot of people having to move um, in because there's not enough food and water in their area. Um, and then of course we get into conflicts over resources. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna keep going, but, but note, note all of these things that are going on, including depression that I just saw flash by there. Uh, and, uh, sorry, my controls are covering my slides. Let's see. Um, so the question I wanna get at here today is how many of our troubles can be helped by this? What is this funny thing on the screen here? Uh, this is a soil aggregate. You heard Elaine make reference to it. Um, this is sand, silt, and clay, little broken down rocks held together um, by biological slimes and glues and, um, and little, the, the, the little threads of life, the fungal hyphae, plant root hairs, et cetera. So it's like sticky and also tied together, little bundles of tiny rock particles. And as you can see, there are, it makes space. So what would be just a, a pile of, of sand, silt, and clay um, suddenly has structure to it. And um, I, as an educator developing curriculum, uh, this was a this was something I came up with. Now people around the world are using this as a teaching tool, um, but it's a really really visual, quick way of getting across uh, degraded soil or unhealthy soil versus healthy soil, and it's a comparison between flour and bread. So um, so if you think about uh, if you think about soil unhealthy soil is just individual particles those sand silt and clay that are not held together um, it's like a pile of flour on the on the ground and if you pick this plate up um, before we before we rain on it if you picked it up and blew on it those soil particles would go uh, would go all over <laughs> the place right and so. So that's one thing is that there is no soil structural integrity to wind. And we see that on the land. So, um, but what happens if you rain on a degraded soil or an unhealthy soil or soil that I would say that does not have the structure and function of a sponge? So we can do this experiment, make a few holes in the bottom of a cup, pour the water on that degraded soil. And of course you can do this out on the land as well with soil itself. But what are you seeing? You start to see uh, erosion, mudslides, flooding. And anyone who's done any baking knows that if you were to dig your finger down there, all that water, it's making something sticky on the top, but it's completely dry underneath. There's no water getting down to the plant roots. There's no water getting down to refill springs or groundwater, but you are having flooding. So this is why flooding and drought are actually two sides of the same issue. Uh, um, and for more reasons than that, because actually when, when we have water that gets down to the plant roots, the plants can then photosynthesize and transpire, which is like sweating. And that's how the water cycle gets going on land and kickstarts the rain cycle. So what is the difference? How do you take flour and turn it into bread? Well, you add biology, right? And that's what we're here about today. So biology takes those little individual particles and sticks them together into something that has a different structure. It has holes in it, has pore spaces. And, and, it's, and the, the sticky stuck together parts are called soil aggregates. First of all, if you blew on this bread, uh, you wouldn't have anything going into the air. But if you rain on it, something really magical happens. I guess that's our word for the day. Because <laughs> uh, here, we, um, at this point on the other plate, everything was already falling apart, right? But what's happening here is it's going sinking in, percolating down. Um, and it's refilling all of those, the groundwater and the springs and the streams. It's getting cleaned as it's going through there. 
the plant roots are happy drinking it up. It's protected from evaporation. There's no erosion happening. There's no flood happening because in a real landscape, what you're seeing seeping out down below is that clean, abundant water that's refilling the springs underground, that's refilling the groundwater, that's there for plant roots, that's there for all the life underground that needs that air and water that those pore spaces make possible. Okay, so um, we're talking about definitions of soil health. One, one way that I like to think about soil health is that it can be determined by the structural and functional integrity of a soil. And that's what I call a soil sponge. So the soil sponge, um, this is just a little review with some different ways of looking at it uh, and a little more information. It keeps soil particles intact in water events. And you can do this experiment. You can take a little screen or an onion bag or something and take some soil that you think is maybe not so healthy and some soil that has that nice like bread-like or cake-like structure and, um, and very gently immerse it in a cup of water. It doesn't have to be a fancy tube like this. It could be just a, um, a, any sort of a clear jar. And you'll see that those slimes and glues, those little threads, keep that healthy soil together. Even if you leave it there for hours, that water's gonna stay clean and clear on the right. Whereas the unhealthy soil just explodes and fills in the water. You'll see this in rivers after a rain. After a rain, does the river run clear or is it brown and muddy? So uh, a really key piece of this, of this, the structural integrity of healthy soil is that it is, it is filtering um, anything that's going through. It's holding it together. It's also biologically breaking down anything that uh, shouldn't be in the water system. And it is capturing, um, capturing things that might go into ponds and rivers and lakes, et cetera. And uh, what we know is that when there is too much manure or too much fertilizer used, we get these dead zones. I don't know those of you who have flown recently, when you look down uh, over an agricultural landscape, the ponds and lakes are often bright green or bright turquoise. Um, it's kind of pretty from the air, but it's really not a good thing those algal blooms in ponds and lakes uh, and in small streams, those are toxic to fish, they are toxic to humans, um, they are causing things like ALS um, and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and also very acute illness. Like if your dog swims in a lake that is bright green with that kind of toxic algae, not all algae are toxic, but particular ones, um, they, they can die very quickly from that. So um, when we're also seeing that those algal blooms and that um, those dead zones moving out into the ocean from where big rivers empty out into the ocean, when the big rivers have had unhealthy soil and a lot of fertilizer use along the edges. Um, so rivers that go through big ag agricultural areas that are not practicing soil health. But if we practice soil health principles, um, you'll, you'll find that um, the rivers and streams and everything gets cleaner and people will be healthier long-term as well as of course, all of the life that lives in, uh, in those waterways. So all of the fish, all of the insects, all of the animals that drink from that. Okay, so then uh, that's the water, but what about um, air? As we said, if you pick up that plate of flour and blow on it, that soil's gonna blow um, all across the landscape and airborne soil is a huge problem. Um, one, of the, one of the things uh, is that they, it lands on snow fields, like on glaciers on top of mountains, which darkens the snow and means that the sun can melt the snow much faster. And, um, uh, and what you get is a very quick melt and you don't get that long seasonal stream flow down into the valleys where people are typically trying to grow food or, to, or need their wells and rivers running. So, um, so that airborne soil is very problematic in terms of climate change in that way. Um, but uh, the other thing with, with uh, airborne soil 
is that it causes lots of respiratory problems um, for humans and animals and everything that lives. Uh, and it also can carry the chemicals that are used in farming and antibiotic resistant bacteria from uh, like from feedlots, et cetera. So, um, so we really don't want, we really don't want that soil to go in the air. And the soil sponge keeps those soil particles intact even when the wind blows. And having, having plant cover on top of the soil is part of that intactness, but it's the soil itself that has that structural integrity. So the other thing is that there is more space underground. Um, there's less compaction. So it's easier for plant roots to grow and for fungi to explore, which helps to um, improve the nutrient integrity of the plants and improves the health of all of life, right? Because plants photosynthesize and they make themselves and then they make food for all of life, both above ground and below ground. Um, they're they're kickstarting the soil food web. So everything that's alive is either eating a plant or eating something that ate a plant or eating something that ate something that ate a plant. And some of that is the plant matter that we see, the, the roots and leaves and et cetera, and flowers and berries. But some of that is the soil, is the exudates that go out underground to feed, to feed things that we may not even be able to see, like those mycorrhizal fungi that you can now see here because this is a microscopic picture taken by our friend, Phil Lee, who is in Australia. Um, that space underground also makes it possible for there to be uh, soil moisture there, um, even during a drought, and also insulate, it's like a big insulation. So, you know, if you think about insulation in the walls to keep a, a house um, cool and also to keep a house warm, it's the same thing with the soil when there is those void spaces, those pores, and that fluffiness of that soil sponge, it helps to regulate the ground temperature. So, um, so you have, uh, that's easier for plants and also for the life underground. So all of that together makes better habitat, right? You get air, water, food, and a regulated climate for, uh, for all of the diverse life underground. And um, my favorite part of all of this is, is about it soaking up rain and filtering that water, which reduces flood risk. It reduces the drought risk. It refills groundwater wells and springs, and it stores water underground for plant growth, for photosynthesis and transpiration. And therefore it kickstarts the water cycle, the carbon cycle and all of climate regulation on land. And we'll talk about that in a minute, about how having water for plants regulates the climate. But I just wanted to take note of this picture for a moment, because this is something called, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting what it's called. It's called a, a rainfall simulator. And in the United States, the, um, the, the soil health team of our US Department of Agriculture has been going around and showing this to, to farmers uh, as a way of helping them understand the benefits of soil health. So these are five pans that um, they're like a cookie cutter. They're open on the bottom. So you press them down and get a soil sample that is intact. And then there's a little screen on the bottom so the soil doesn't fall out. Um, and then they have like a shower head that goes across the top that rains on all of this. So we've put about three or four inches of rain on three or four inches of soil here. So quite a lot of rain for that small amount of soil. These five soil samples are all from the same farm. They are all the same soil type. So same ratio of sand, silt, and clay. You may have heard that a soil's ability to absorb water is determined by the ratio of sand particles, silt particles, and clay particles by the particle size. Because you know if you're at the beach and you pour water onto, uh, onto the sand, it sinks in really quickly, right? Or if you poured it onto clay, it would sink in slowly. But in fact, any type of soil, any ratio of sand, silt, and clay can be improved by using soil health principles. And if you look at the jars underneath, on the far right, those jars in the back, no water has gotten down three inches into the soil. It's all run off and it's taken all that soil with it. Whereas if you look on the far left where all the soil health principles are being used, 
where there's um, not the soil is not being disturbed. There's living roots and plants. Um, there's diversity, et cetera, um, and not using biocides and not using fertilizers. You see all the water has sunk in and nothing has run off. Okay, I love this let's... example, Didi. I just wanted, <laughs> as you had asked, to let you know that you've got about three or four minutes left. Okay, I got, I've actually got a timer going myself too. Thank you. Um, uh, so let's just talk quickly about how plants regulate the climate because it, it's not just plants themselves, it's plants that have their feet in a sponge. So if plants can transpire water, um, then they, and, and they can photosynthesize, that's how the climate basically gets regulated. And it's a, it's a, it's a beneficial cycle because plants grow the sponge and plants benefit from the sponge. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. So the first one that you've probably heard about is that, that plant growth or photosynthesis takes atmospheric carbon, CO2, same carbon we're worried about with climate change, and turns it into themselves, but through that into all of other life and life's residues, so like soil organic matter. So um, we can think of that as like living the dead and the very dead, and it's all full of carbon. So, so drawing down carbon into living systems is one way that plants regulate the climate. Uh, and just remember, we need a greenhouse. We need a greenhouse effect to keep us warm enough and cool enough. Um, without it, we'd be in trouble. We just have a little too much. Um, the second thing is that plants help shade the ground. So it prevents heat from reaching the ground and it reduces the air temperature by reducing how much of that heat is re-radiating back into the ground. You can imagine if you were standing on the right side of this fence um, versus on the left, your feet would be hotter and probably the air above that bare soil would be hotter as well. But the third one that's really exciting is transpiration, which is like plants sweating. They take that water up through their feet, a little different than us, and, um, and as they're as they're growing, they sweat it out. So that water evaporates from the plants and changes from liquid water into, um, into a gas, into water vapor. And in doing that, it takes something called sensible heat, which is the heat we can feel, and it turns it into latent heat, which is no longer warming the air. Um, and so uh, I've, I remember, and Sophie is here today, standing under tents in India that where there were no plants, that it was hotter in the shade than it was going standing out in the full sun among those beautiful tall cover crops. That was where I really started to get this. Um, so two of the scientists I work with, Walter Yena and John Norman, have figured out that um, transpiration alone in theory could actually reduce uh, reverse the global warming we've already experienced. So if we, if we could have 25% more photosynthesis and transpiration on agricultural land, that could in theory reverse global warming that's already happened. That's amazing. And that's something we could do in probably in one season. Okay, um, and we could, so, so three goals here. One is to increase photosynthesis by 25% on, on ag land. That's worldwide. Um, we can do this with more plant density, so less bare ground, more diversity, so more complex leaf structures, more height, not overgrazing, undergrazing, overcutting. And of course, we're not even talking about lawns here, but lawns policies of how long people are allowed to have their lawns is important or by increasing the length of the green growing season. So delaying um, the harvest or tillage, having more perennials, using plants that know how to work in current conditions and having more soil sponge structure and function will lengthen that. Goal two, feed and protect the soil sponge, keep it covered, reduce or eliminate stresses and reduce or eliminate fertilizers and biocides. Goal three, invite all the workers to the farm table and don't kill them. So as Elaine said, there's this huge web of stuff going on, both underground and above ground, that all makes this whole thing work. So provide food for everyone, habitat for everyone, 
good working conditions and balance nature with nature rather than pesticides. So those are those three goals. We can actually do this. We can make all of these things that we're worried about, we can address them through healthy soil, healthy landscapes. So um, I wanted, um, Sammy, if, if we have two minutes, I would love to just bring up that um, video of how this is being put into action in India. And while we're waiting for that, I'll just invite people, if you wanna download the free manual, Understanding Soil Health and Watershed Function, you can find that at landandleadership.org. I think it's under resources. And, um, and if you're interested in joining the land and leadership development community, you can read about it there or send me an email and I will tell you more about it. Um, if that's, I can share it if you don't have it. There's My something. PowerPoint closed down, so I'm having to yeah. restart. If you have it available, the I do. Here we go. So uh, oh, there's my timer, but I think, are we okay with me? Just going to, this is two minutes or less here. Go for it, Didi. Of course, okay. totally important. Um, yes. So, um, so this, is, this is in Andhra Pradesh, India. This is this amazing project um, that um, the women's self-help economic groups uh, are really spearheading of getting of thousands of farmers to adopt natural farming practices. Um, and they are um, working with the um, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization Farmer Field School Program, which helps farmers to, um, to work together to do research together. But what I wanted to, to um, show you here is just imagine when we talk about 25% more photosynthesis on, on agricultural land, and we talk about all those effects of building this sort of sponge, of cooling, of feeding all of life. Um, you, those drone pictures you can see um, are just extraordinary um, of this like green carpet in the middle of a, of a big dry, dry area. And what they've started doing is something called pre-monsoon dry seeding where they are um, growing uh, crops before they even get the rain going by understanding how the soil sponge works, how micro, uh, biostimulants can help wake up the soil food web underground, um, how uh, using herbal, uh, herbal insect repellents, and yeah, here's this term, but it's, I just think it's just amazing. Oh, no, that's not the one, but, um, and, uh, and farmers are not using any inputs from outside of the village. So they're everything there, there's the one. Um, there's 25% more, <laughs> uh, more, more photosynthesis and transpiration. So um, let me stop share so I can see you all for a moment. Well, that's um, so, so exciting. Anyway, I just find that incredibly inspiring. I'm really, really delighted to be working with that program to develop um, a yet another training handbook on soil and water and the soil sponge. So well, I'm happy to talk more about that during the Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you so much, Didi. I want to go ahead and turn over to Dan and Stefan um, for part three, the benefits uh, to human health. All right, great. Um, I think you can turn the slides off for a minute if you want at least. But uh, my name is Dan Kittridge, as I said earlier. Um, you know, the BFA has been doing a um, what we call Principles of Biological Systems course, working with growers for the past 10 years, um, helping them understand the foundational dynamics that are necessary for life to function, the whole, the whole food chain, food web, um, to Elaine's point. And you know, foundational to it, of course, is the microbes, the bottom of the food chain, um, food web, <laughs> the center of the food web. How, how shall we, the center of the evolutionary biological um, um, pathway, really, it's the microbes that evolve the plants and evolve the animals. Um, so, yeah, a deep respect for everything Elaine's been doing. You know, I think, I'm not sure people appreciate what she's been doing for how many years, but 40 years ago or so when she said, maybe, Maybe fungus in the soil, they're not all bad. And people said, no. <laughs> and now people know about this stuff, right? I mean, she's really been a leader in this total space. Um, so 
um, and Didi, everything you're doing with the with the, the soil structure and sponge and Andra, I mean, people should view that video. It's really so impressive uh, what's being done in the global community uh, with these principles and insights. We think here in North America that we're, you know, or not everyone's here obviously from North America, but we we really are, um, you know, on the cutting edge, but in, uh, we have a lot to learn from other parts of the world. So just, yeah, it's great. Um, my part, the VFA's part, you know, formally we're an organization, a nonprofit focusing on food quality. And we're saying the point where, you know, we can actually have some really profound effect is if we choose the food we eat every day based on its inherent quality. We understand that connects to soil health, to biological system function, to farm viability, uh, to environmental health, uh, human health. Most people are driven by their foundational um, you know, dynamics of life and the, the health, their health and the health of their children, I think, you know, for most people is actually more visceral than the health of the environment. And so the question is for us, how can we engage the science, this understanding um, and money and power and the world as it currently exists? So we as an organization have been working for the past uh, five years on this really more proactive <clears throat> You know, question of nutrient density. I think it's a term that if people have heard it, we've started to popularize it around 10 years ago or so. Um, and the concept was that there's variation in nutrient levels in food. That's a foundational, foundational point. Um, if you've eaten a tomato off the shelf from the grocery store in January, if you're living in the northern hemisphere, or a tomato off the vine from the field in you know August, <laughs> again, in the northern hemisphere you know the variation and that's your inbuilt nutrient sensor, sensing you know, hardware, your nose and your tongue and your body telling you this is different. Um, so what we've said is if we could help people choose the variation in food that they are eating, you know, obviously help them grow it. But for those who aren't growing everything all the time with money, which actually is a power in the world, choose that what's better for them. We're actually facilitating what's better for the environment. And that's a really powerful vector because X number of billion hectares on the planet are managed through agriculture. And if we can inspire support growers through better economic viability by choosing what they're producing on top of all the other things, um, that can really help speed the process up. So we started five years ago, um, well, 2016 with the concept that we need to identify variation, we need to connect it to the management practices and we need to build the ability to sense to test in real time. Um, we've got a, you know, a little meter that's a basically is a prototype that functions for flashing light at things, wheat berries or zucchini squash or lettuce heads and getting readings. Um, we started in 2017 with the lab and we tested um, carrots and spinach. We looked at you know, samples from grocery stores and farmers markets and farms across the US, um, organic, not organic, et cetera. And we found variations we were just looking at elements and a couple of compounds, things like copper and zinc and sulfur and phosphorus and you know, antioxidants and polyphenols. And the variations were three to one to 15 to one on minerals, which is massive, right? This leaf of spinach has as many, has as much iron in it as those 15 leaves of spinach. And then we looked at the compounds, the flavor, the health giving compounds, polyphenols, antioxidants, it was more like 75 to one. Um, in 20, um, 19, we set up a second lab at Chico State and we started looking at a few more crops and also looking at the soil and the management practices and documented the practice, soil type, fertility program, tillage, inoculants, seed planting date, cover crops, and the soil, so organic matter and minerals and biological activity, and overlay that on, on um, nutrient levels. In 2020, we had another lab in France, up to over 20 crops. Um, and we, you know, basically showed some really nice connections between management practices, soil health metrics like soil carbon, and nutrient levels. So I'm going to use the small time I have remaining to just run through a couple slides on that and then hand it over to Stefan. You know, we have done basically this variation thing for roots, leaves, fruits, and grains. And now we're looking to define nutrient density to be able to say, this is better, this is decent, this is not so good. So. Yeah, move it forward here. <clears throat> I think just uh, forward on the, yeah, and keep going. So this is basically looking at tillage as one practice. Um, light tillage is less than six uh, inches. Um, heavy tillage is more than six. 
and this is the effect of change on um, wheat in uh, organic matter based on tillage. So look at that. It's obviously this is you know average farm size was three thousand acres, uh, two continents, uh, thirteen U.S. states, I think. Move it forward. Yep. Proceed forward. So this is the connection between tillage and nutrient levels. Decreases 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent. Um, you know, when you engage in that process of destroying the soil, functionally, what, what you affect is a decrease in the nutrient levels in the food itself. Um, this is just one crop out of, you know, more than 20 we've done, um, but on scale and very good data, uh, you know, sample size, et cetera. Okay, keep going. This is the nutrient variations um, as defined by percent of USRDA. So how much calcium do you need per day per serving? You know, how much do you get per serving of wheat? How much do you get per serving of oats? If you had bread or you had oatmeal, um, look at, uh, we'll look at potassium on, on wheat there in the middle and uh, K, you know, one serving of wheat, one you know, slice of bread might give you 5% of your potassium needs for the day or 22%. Um, magnesium, basically nothing or 30%. People know about magnesium deficiencies. Drop down to the bottom for zinc, basically nothing or 34%. How many people planet wide suffer suffer from stunting? You know, U, UN serious dynamics here. This is the variation we found. The variation we found in crops that exists is very significant from a nutritional standpoint. Um, over there on oats, same thing. Um, uh, those are just these are just grains. We did roots, leaves, and fruits as well. Um, proceed forward. So this is a slide on wheat. Um, just one more step forward. So those red uh, dots are growers that were working together on more biological management. This is the global sample. And the green dots is everybody else. You know, I mean, this is, this is it's a meta system, right? Biological systems have multiple factors, so we can't just draw direct connections, but we can see Management practices, soil carbon. We can see soil carbon, you know, management practices, um, nutrient levels. We can see management practices, nutrient levels. Um, it really looks like it's not so much about the variety you're using or the, the geography you're in. It's really about how you work with the land that affects what's in the food. Um, so I'll stop there. I think we're, um, maybe that was my 10 minutes, but hand it off to Stefan. Um, we have looked at these variations on roots, leaves, fruits, and grains. I'll put in some links in the chat after I get done speaking about where links are. You can see what we've been doing. Um, right now we're working on nutrient density, which is not just top to bottom calcium, to, you know, top to bottom polyphenols, but better, decent, not so good. And we're starting with beef because it's the crop with the largest market value on the planet and affects the largest amount of land on the planet. And if we can understand a way to provide consumers the ability to actually choose the burger, the steak, whatever it is that you buy, because people do buy beef. Based on quality, that should have profound effects on the landscape in short order. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, Dan. And uh, I will uh, try to keep it brief so we have plenty of time for uh, Q&A. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the beef nutrient density project that uh, we're doing. Um, Oftentimes we hear this connection between soil health, plant health, animal health, human health. Um, there's not a lot of systems research out there to suggest that that is the case, even mm -hmm. though it intuitively makes sense. So we're doing a, a beef nutrient density project. The goal is to um, collect samples from 250 farmers over the next couple of years. Uh, please advance the next slide. Um, in beef. We are doing this in grass-fed and grain-fed systems and linking that to causal factors of management, so soil health and forage feed quality. Uh, there's likely tremendous variation between uh, more rotational grazing and continuous grazing. We know it's the case for soil health, so it would be expected as the case for nutrient density too. 
And not all feedlot systems are created equal either is what we're finding in our data so far. And what really makes our analysis unique is that we do deep metabolic profiling. So not just looking at fats, omega-3 fatty acids, which is common, but we look at take a more holistic approach because foods contain hundreds to thousands of nutrients and compounds that can in, impact our health. And we're linking health along that uh, continuum. And please advance the slides. So just to talk about the data so far, if, if, if you're a consumer and you pick up a package of beef, you see a handful of nutrients appearing. It's about 13 nutrients, your protein, fats, and a handful of vitamins and minerals. Um, a lot of our knowledge on how production impacts uh, these, these small amounts of nutrients um, is obviously very, very powerful, but we need to take a more holistic approach because the food matrix contains hundreds or thousands of bioactive compounds that have not been at the forefront, but they do impact our, our health. So we profile for a much larger number of nutrients. And if you look at the table on the right, this was a comparison of grass fat and grain fed beef from 18 uh, samples. And we identified 568 uh, compounds using our food metabolomics approaches, which is much more than has previously been, been done. And oftentimes we hear about the difference in omega-3 fatty acids, but you can see here, the, uh, 65% of these biochemicals were different. So illustrating that the difference go far beyond omega-3 fatty acids. And certainly not all these compounds that we measure are uh, nutrients because we also get insight into, into animal health. But as you can see, there are uh, substantial differences and arguably larger than I had even anticipated. And uh, these differences are also arguably not known with the consumer at the moment. So if we advance the slide, then we can see this is markers of animal health. So I'm originally trained as a human nutrition scientist, and we do these studies on humans too. We, we take small pieces of muscle through a muscle biopsy, um, and we've profiled that before. We've done this in individuals with metabolic syndrome. We have done this in endurance-trained athletes, but we've also profiled meat samples, muscle of animals. And what is quite striking there is that the animals that have uh, that are pasture raised and move around a lot and, and eat uh, phytochemically rich forage, their mitochondria, which is the energy or the life of cells, and these biochemicals, you can see citrate, succinate, fumarate, malate, those are all intermediates in mitochondria. So, mitochondria, they produce the, the energy or the life of our cells. And we see that that life is higher in, in grass fed uh, uh, samples. So, uh, about one to one and a half to two fold higher in the, in the green means higher. It was higher in the grass fed samples. And then uric acid is a, is a major intracellular antioxidant and higher levels indicate in, improved antioxidant status in the animal. And there's about a uh, hundred more metabolites that all point to the same direction, suggesting that the pasture raised animals display more of an athletic uh, phenotype not unlike you would uh, see in humans. Uh, after all, cattle and humans were, were both mammals and uh, uh, the differences uh, in, in that regard are striking compared to uh, when we compare healthy adult phenotypes in humans and animals. So let's move on to nutrient density. Nutrient density can be defined as, uh, we are specifically looking at phytochemicals, which are plant secondary compounds, antioxidants that are picked up from the forage and incorporated into the meat. Um, a lot of these have anti-inflammatory effects, antimicrobial effects. Various studies suggest that at least in, 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 uh, in the lab, they can have anti-cancer and anti-diabetic effects. We also look at vitamins and minerals and, of course, fatty acids. So if we jump into that uh, for the last few slides. So phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are produced by plants. When animals graze these phytochemicals, these plant compounds, as you can see on the top left, they are metabolized to a whole variety of, of different compounds. And these compounds are uh, compounds with potential anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. The figure on the right, you can see phytochemical metabolism, and I've highlighted a few here. But what you can see here is that these phytochemicals are consistently higher in the grass-fed animals, which is di the direct result of them grazing a wide variety and a diversity of plants. 
Um, so if we move on to the next slide, we see the same thing happening in these vitamin metabolites, which are also have a relationship to improved soil health and improved uh, plant health. If we look at vitamin B3, niacin, which is the main form of vitamin B3 in foods, this was ninefold higher in the grass-fed beef, which is directly related to the forage and uh, presumably also soil health. Um, niacin and nicotinamide are both vitamin B3, but niacin is the most abundant form in food found in nature. That was ninefold higher in the grass-fed animals, whereas nicotinamide, the supplemental or synthetic form, was about twice as high in the grain-fed animals, which is likely due to the fact that uh, this is commonly used in, in uh, finishing rations. Uh, choline, another essential amino, uh, essential nutrient, 1.2-fold higher, and alpha decafrol and ascorbate vitamin C were also found to be higher in the grass-fed animals. Um, decafrol is a vitamin E precursor, best known for the antioxidant effects, and they are, again, directly related to consuming phytochemically rich forage. So we are seeing this relationship between more uh, phytochemically rich plants and more nutrient-dense beef. So if we go to the final slide, and I just want to highlight this because we often hear about omega-3 fatty acids and the omega-3 fatty acids uh, that would be uh, EPA and DHA, uh, they are enriched in grass-fed beef. But what we are seeing in our data, and I think this is not well known with the consumer at the moment, is that within the saturated fatty acids, often thought to be bad for our health, we actually see that uh, Within these saturated fatty acids, it's, it's a broad category. There, there are uh, maybe 10 to 20 different saturated fatty acids. And these longer chain saturated fatty acids that are actually associated in population-based studies with a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease, again, become enriched in the grass-fed beef because of uh, the forages that they consume. So again, uh, not all saturated fat is created equal either. And so we see these multiple patterns appearing where if we feed the animal a more diverse and phytochemically rich forage, we see their health improving and their nutrients improving. With that, I wanna say is that that doesn't per se mean that grain-fed beef is therefore unhealthy, but as compared to grain-fed beef, grass-fed beef does have additional benefits. And, but there are also nuances, and I must uh, say this is that when uh, we've done studies, when the higher amount of fodder or forage is fed in feedlot systems, we see that uh, then the, the grain fed beef or the feedlot beef also recovers some of that nutrient density. So it is certainly not black and white or, or a simplified narrative that this is good or bad, but the data is what it is. Uh, final slide. So within the beef nutrient density project, this is our working hypothesis. If we raise animals on more plant diverse uh, species, we see higher nutrient density of meat compared to monocultures or overgrazing with the lowest amounts of uh, uh, found in feedlot uh, meat at the moment. But the goal of this work is to figure out this variation and link it back to causal factors because grass-fed beef isn't grass-fed beef isn't grass-fed beef and grain-fed beef isn't grain-fed beef isn't grain-fed beef. And the goal is to improve back best practices amongst uh, each of these systems. And with that, I'd uh, like to end my part of the presentation and uh, looking forward to uh, the Q&A. Finally, though, how can this benefit us or uh, producers and consumers? Well, we can highlight the best practices. So inform management practices, inform consumers about the potential healthfulness of meat. So marketing that potentially to consumers uh, when we know more about the nutrient density. And obviously the, the bigger picture is as we try to nourish a growing population, do so sustainably, uh, we must think also of environmental and economic factors. And I wanna highlight the IPCC report that came out recently. Yes, the report calls for moving towards uh, uh, more plant-based patterns and increasing our plant-based foods, but the report also stressed the use of agroecological livestock production systems, which means rotational grazing, integrated crop livestock systems, silvopastoralism, which are the practices that we are investigating and are finding that they indeed produce more healthier soils, healthier animals, and potentially also healthier humans, which will be studied as part of randomized control trials we do in the next few years. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Stefan and Dan. Um, 
and it's such a great point that you made there about the um, the value of properly managed um, rotational grazing systems uh, where we've seen so much soil health benefit um, in the long run. In fact, I know a few ways that I've ever read about to more rapidly recover um, soil health than to use perennial um, pasture systems um, to do so. So we're going to move into our Q&A session and we are running a little behind today. So in order to get the the webinar finished in time and, and make sure that the panelists are able to go to their next event. We have about 30 minutes instead of 45. Um, but let's, uh, let's, let's pull up our few first Q&A, our first question. Oh, I'm sorry there, our tech, we seem to be having a little bit of a technical glitch. Brian, um, will you take that away for us? Sure, I'll read out the first question and then uh, I'll try to get them into a slide form so that we can, uh, the participants can see it. So the first question is from Diane and Diane asks, I'm disheartened at people's apathy towards land regeneration as a tool to combat climate change or towards climate change itself. What has been your most successful approach to influencing the average person on these topics? All right, Bellis, what say you? I'll just say really quickly, um, our hypothesis is that if people care about themselves and their families and that connects to the land, then that's a really powerful vector. And I, I would say that um, it's really key to get everybody moving toward the things that they all want. Um, and so, um, so anytime that we start using language sort of fighting language or, or turning around and what fighting against what we don't want um, is, a, is um, getting people into arguing about what that is. Whereas it's much easier to say, we all want regulated temperatures, whether, whether we think that an ice age is coming or we think that climate change is coming. We all want clean air, we all want clean water, we all want enough food, we all want protection from floods, whatever they're being caused by. So I found that Soil health offers really an opportunity to, to bring people together and to move everybody along. And similarly, not talking about like who are good farmers or bad farmers, but just like, like having everybody move forward together. Um, I'll just add my, my opinion is that uh, knowledge is power, both knowledge from the consumer standpoint. So the more we can educate folks on the importance of soil health and soil biology and how that relates to human health is fantastic. Uh, but that's also informing the producers, the people that are actually, you know, doing the growing or the raising of animals and so forth, and making sure that they have the education and knowledge. And, um, and unfortunately, I think our university systems are lacking that sense, but are starting to catch up. And um, I think as this really starts to, to progress forward, I think we'll see a big momentum shift, both from the producers and the consumers as well. Oh, Brian, I can really back up what you just said about our university systems, which um, I'm a product of the land grant system myself, but um, I've, I've done quite a bit of talking to peers about the ingrained paradigms for the industrial um, kind of system of agriculture. And I'm actually here in Greece currently at a conference where when I presented about that, I had a number of young faculty members across the land grant system come and have conversation with me afterwards about how ready they are for that shift to occur. And agroecology is being talked about by young land grant professors, tenure track professors. Um, regenerative agriculture is being talked about. And I think that's an exciting um, step, uh, especially, you know, actually it's, it's in many cases, the social scientists who work in community development that have seen the values of these kinds of systems and their research is, is starting to, to reach more and more people. Um, so yeah, great. Thanks for bringing that point up. Yeah. And, and to add to that, it's that I'm an early career researcher myself in the, at a land grant university, but it's also a matter of just doing it, right? Uh, if you get the do the research, and and, and uh, um, we obviously let the chips fall where they may, and, and let the data show what it shows. But yeah, it's just also a matter of, of just taking the plunge and doing it. And I think the younger generation absolutely is uh, uh, moving towards that. And 
yeah, it will become more important as the future wears on. So I think the time is also right to uh, start investigating these things now. Great, uh, DD, Elaine, anything else you guys want to add before we move to the next question? See, DD said no, and Elaine? Uh I will just oh, say that sure. that bread and flour thing is is so easy. I've done it in kindergarten <laughs> classrooms. I've done it on Wall Street. I've done it at the UN. Everybody gets it. So, <laughs> agreed. Elaine, any uh, closing comments on that question? Nope. I'm no. I'm fine. <laughs> uh, the other people have spoken for me. Go for it. It got well covered. Yep. Yep. All right. Let me go ahead and share out. The next question. Uh, so the next question was from uh, Sonia, and this is for Dr. Van Bielt. Um, are you aware of anyone doing research on the links between soil health, gut microbiome health, and mental health? Thank you, Sonia. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, certainly this work is starting, but and, and the systems research is becoming of increasingly more important, right? So I have a background in human nutrition and medical school cultural schools or let alone uh, soil health. I think, I think it's really hard to answer that question because we are almost assuming that there's a single value for soil health. And that's not true. If you're trying to grow brassicas, if that's the crop that you want, you're going to have to have a soil food web that um, uh, provides for that, you know, gives the, um, does, does the right nutrient cycling. The exudates coming out of the brassica is going to be very different. It wants a different ratio of fungi to bacteria in the soil. It's going to make certain that it maintains that ratio by the exudates that it's producing. Well, what if you, what you want to eat uh, is carrots or um corn or blueberries or you know apples the biology in the soil needs to be very very different um, the ratios of fungi to bacteria and therefore the predators uh, as we go into different biomes we have completely different um, species that we're dealing with so it's not that easy to define soil health because it's relative to the stage of succession that's what you have to, you've got to have that comparison chart in order to make certain that the broccoli is going to be the best it can be and have the most nutrition, or the corn is going to have all the nutrition it needs, or the apples are going to need, have all it, it, that it needs. And I'll just say that um, two things. One is that in, in the first third of my book, The Ecology of Care, that is a lot of what the topic of, of that part of, part of the book is about. And um, the other thing is that that glyphosate or Roundup um, was patented as both as an herbicide and as a broad spectrum microbial and antimicrobial or antibiotic um, by, by Monsanto. Um, and the reason it works as both of those is because it interrupts something called the Shikimate pathway that exists in plants and in bacteria, but not in animals or, or, or insects. However, um, what we know is that our, our gut microbiome and our skin microbiome and our uterine microbiome and all, you know, all the microbiomes that exist in our body, even our blood um, for, for all animals, it regulates our entire system. It produces our brain chemicals, it produces, it, it, produces, you know, regulates our digestion, it regulates immunity, et cetera. So if we take something, if we use something in agriculture um, or even on our lawns, that is a, an herbicide that's also a broad spectrum antimicrobial, and it's now in our water and in our air and in our food, uh, for not just for us, but for all of life, we are disrupting that microbial animal symbiosis uh, and we're deeply disrupting one of the most basic things that makes us who we are. Like we are, we are, we are a moving bubble for microbes. That's 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 how that's how our whole body works. Um, so 
So that's a very direct link between soil health practices that, that eliminate um, that particular herbicide. And we know that, that all the other biocides, basically, um, you know, all the other pesticides, I don't think, I don't think their pests exist, um, <laughs> but um, all the other biocides are killing off something that is part of our whole ecosystem, right? So fungicides, we have fungi and yeast, et cetera, that live in us too. So, um, so that's, that's one direct link. And then there's a lot of research about that people who grow up on farms or around soil, et cetera, playing children who grow up playing in, in relatively healthy dirt, uh, have, have healthier microbiomes. And we know that taking, um, dewor that dewormers, um, decrease our immunity. So, so worms in the body perform a role. They help our immune system from overreacting to things. So there, yeah, there are a lot of links that may not, may not, people often think, oh, it's just about eating soil, you know, and it's not, it's not quite that direct, but there's a lot of links there. So the ecology of care gets into all of that. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, panelists. I think we can move on to the next question. Uh, the next question is going to be from uh, Tanya. What is the best replacement for chemical fertilizers, NPK, that we could use right now, maintaining crop yields and improving soil without drastically altering farm practices? Well, the best replacement for the chemical fertilizers is a well-made compost that has all of the um, different um, organism groups that your plant might require. We have um, started to develop uh, kind of a rating scale for that compost. We have to have a minimum of this number of bacteria and fungi and protozoan nematodes, this kind of diversity present in those groups to know that it's going to be able to um, deal with all of the needs of your plants. So you've got to have a minimum value of these organisms in your system. And then you've got to balance your fungal to bacterial biomass ratio. And it's really pretty easy. Um, you put the appropriate foods in along with the properly made compost. And it has to be aerobic. That's a really important aspect. Um, you cannot let it become anaerobic because these anaerobic conditions are, are where the disease causing organisms thrive. So um, starting to make, you know, grow your own compost or buy it from somebody locally that um, is, you know, has looked at the um, minimum levels um, for a biologically complete compost, would, that would be my suggestion on the way to go. And that means you can delete all of that inorganic fertilizer right from the very beginning. I don't know how many of you have noticed, but inorganic fertilizers have increased in cost by something like, I was told earlier this morning, 800% increase in inorganic fertilizers. Where are all our farmers gonna find uh, the money to pay for those inorganic fertilizers to go out? We need to be making compost for these folks. We need to be helping them out by giving them an organic alternative um, way of putting, fer putting um, fertilizer back in their soil. I'm so glad that you have brought that up, Elaine, because it gives me the chance to thank you publicly, as I've done a couple of times, for bringing this knowledge to me at a point in my career when I was desperately looking for such a strong point of leverage. Um, if you look back at the papers I was writing as an academic two or three years ago, when I was still a postdoctoral researcher, I was trying to find a way to replace inorganic fertilizers because I saw how devastating they were environmentally in the world, ecologically um, to the soil system. And um, so with mycorrhizal fungi, with biochar, with worm compost, I was toying around with all these different little mixtures of things, 50% the normal rate of nitrogen. Can we get by with that and looking for the efficiency? And then seven months ago, when I joined Soil Food Web School and took the foundation courses, I said, aha, this is what I've been looking for for a decade. And um, it's just, uh, it's been awesome to see the way that, um, so we've had farmers on here like Adam York, 
who have done this on a massive scale and um, and that it's really the foil to that entrenched paradigm from the industrial system that says you have to have agrochemicals, you have to have agrochemicals. You know, I, 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 every time I wish every farmer in the world, if I could, if I could send out one message is if you reach for a chemical, think to yourself, how could be this? The, how could this be the last time any chemical on your shelf? How could this be the last time I need this? And I, I fully believe that it's the soil food web and, and the other principles of regenerative agriculture, agroecosystem management that can help them abandon those chemicals forever. Yeah, I, I'm glad you, you keyed on the last your statement there Adam, around management. You know, as Elaine mentioned, it's, you know, getting that soil food web reestablished back in the soil is really important. We use compost and liquid amendments like teas and extracts and so forth to do that. Um, but the other important thing is the farmers have a significant role in the practices that they do. Tilling is a good example as a management practice that you need to find an alternative for because you're really going to be interrupting those microorganisms uh, in the soil. You know, I, I tend to go through this exercise with a lot of my clients, which is, Let's look at your management practice and identify, are they harming soil biology? Are they neutral to it or are they beneficial? And what we really try to do is prioritize any of those harmful practices to the, to the soil microbiome. How can we find alternatives to those management practices to move it either to a neutral or a beneficial? And then once you do all the harmfuls, then move into the neutrals until you, you are able to change the management practices that the farmer uses to help support that to microbiome in the soil. Um, and it, it's, it's really kind of an education process you have to go through with your clients as well, with the farmers, the producers. Anybody else wanna add onto this question before we move to the next one? Okay, let's move to the next question. Next question is going to be from Jesse. And Jesse asks, we have a problem of heavy metals in avocados, specifically cadmium. Can we manage this problem with a life in the soil approach? Yeah, sure we can. Um, what we've got to do is tie up that cadmium in, that is present in your soil and put, put it into a not plant available form. So it would be uh, working with composts. Um, so we get the organisms back into your soil that will put that cadmium back into a biologically viable place. Your plant requires some cadmium, but not a lot. Um, so we don't want to be removing all of the cadmium from the soil, but we have to get it down below uh, a level that is not going to be available to your plant or it's um, you know, actually physically removed from the system. And so we'd have to sit down and, and chat and talk with you about what the um, most, what the easiest way is to get things put back into the, get the cadmium put back into the structure of the organic matter. I have nothing else to add to anybody else. <laughs> Pretty succinct answer, Elaine. <laughs> I didn't know I had it in me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Uh, so the next question is from Tracy. And, it, and Tracy's question is, what do you think of using mycorrhizae powder to help boost fungi, in my case, in meadow restorations, but could apply to other projects as well? Would say you I panelists. take this one? Oh, yeah, I think it's right up your alley there, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done research into mycorrhizal inoculants, commercially available mycorrhizal inoculants, and I'm very, very skeptical of the claims. Um, we, in many cases, we found no living mycorrhizae. Some researchers have done work and they have not even found mycorrhizal DNA in the products sold as mycorrhizal fungi. And we turned those products in, uh, some of them that we assessed into a soil testing lab and found they had very high amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus in them from some kind of other carrier, say fish meal or something. And so instead of getting a locally adapted, viable mycorrhizal strain that would partner with your plants, you know, where you've paired the soil that you have with the mycorrhizae that have evolved in that soil, um, you actually could be disrupting the relationship, right? By putting heavy amounts of something like phosphorus onto the plant early in its growing cycle so that the plant doesn't signal, hey, I need some mycorrhizae here. I'm, this, this, I'm, I'm looking for some help getting a little zinc or getting a little um, uh, you know, water out of the soil system. Instead, it's, it's shutting down 
that communication, that chemical dialogue, um, when you have high rates of something like phosphorus. So it's just a very unregulated market. Um, and I, I've used this metaphor before, maybe on another webinar, but if we think about, um, you know, if your goal is to say, oh, we want to increase, uh, you know, something in the Serengeti, let's put out millions of poodles in the Serengeti. Well, you'd have a bunch of poodles in the Serengeti for like a week, and then they would all get eaten. And if you put out these non-local mycorrhizae, uh, one of the things that could happen is that they could die out. Another thing that could happen is that they could become invasive in that system, right? We just don't know the, the, the long-term effects. And, um, you know, sometimes I see where one region uh, is producing mycorrhizal inoculant um, as a commercial product, say in the Pacific Northwest where I live. And farmers are using that in Oklahoma. Farmers are using that in Florida. Farmers are using that in Connecticut. And I'm like, that's probably not the same kinds of mycorrhizae that should be in those places, uh, especially not in terms of their genetics. So I very much like to, to turn people away from that idea. Yeah, that's why we like to um, make the compost that we're going to use locally so that all the starting material comes in with the indigenous sets of organisms. We make sure the conditions in that composting process are going to select the beneficials and against the diseases and pests and, and problems. So it's not that difficult to get these organisms back into your soil if you are paying attention to making proper compost. Yeah, I think I love, you know, I love that example of the poodle, putting a poodle out. <laughs> so, um, I, the mental I, uh, image. <laughs> you know, that's another thing is just just like with um, probiotics. I mean, as soon as someone figures out that there's something that could be patented and sold, um, um, it will happen. And and most people don't think like, well, where can I get this? You know, where can I where where would this be happening naturally? in my food system or in my land. So um, we just always have to keep an eye out for that, that extractive paradigm that creeps in everywhere because everybody's, you know, our kind of societies are in collapse, capitalism are kind of an end stage. And uh, <laughs> so, so everybody needs money and, <laughs> and uh, everyone's trying to figure out how to make things work. So, but, um, but I think there are better ways. Well, you know, there's a whole movement about going local, and uh, this really particularly applies to the work that we do. You know, as Elaine mentioned, indigenous microorganisms, and you, Adam, you mentioned it as well, you know, the indigenous microorganisms are would have, have, you know, evolved over the eons in that particular bioclimate to be able to thrive for the plants that are growing in those systems. And, um, you know, I think there is going to be a lot of movement towards creating these hubs of making compost, um, you know, on-farm compost and making, you know, liquid amendments that are going to be serviced in the local area. That's really where I think this is uh, moving towards in the agricultural space. Okay, any uh, other comments before we move on to the next question? All right, um, I love this next question. Uh, this question is from Rebecca. If we can make that sort of impact in one season, what is stopping us? Why is this not happening? What is the big blockers we have right now? What say you panelists? <laughs> uh, don't get me started. <laughs> it's, it's uh, it, you know, uh, you go to grower meetings and uh, give a pre presentation of all of the benefits that could come from uh, you know, giving, getting the right sets of microorganisms. And you know, the first thing you hear when you're you know, at the coffee break is, you know, that woman's crazy. She just doesn't know what she's talking about. If it, if it actually, if what she was talking about actually worked, then we'd already be doing it. And uh, it's just an aggravating thing that uh, at least we're having a lot more, a lot of success because people are actually following directions now and um, getting their compost made properly uh, so that they have only the beneficials uh, present. And you're aiming things for the specific uh, plants that you're growing. So you're optimizing your soil for that crop. 
in that place. Um, so I think the chemical companies are still a huge problem. Yeah, this is something I see all the time. Um, you know that, you know, a, a grower is you know, some producer. They typically have a lot of different what they would consider trusted advisors. This comes from the university, the extensions, their PCAs, their fertilizer salesmen. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And when the farmer knows, hey, look, I, I can see the right on the wall. You know, I'm going into negative territory. This is something I have to make a change in my farm. The people that are supporting them sometimes are very resistant to that change. And so they're hearing a lot of different voices. And so for a lot of these producers, they want to kind of dip their toe into it, um, which that's OK. I'll, I'll take a farmer that's willing to do a trial. And, you know, I'll tell them, give me your worst block. Give me the the, bad, the worst performing area that you've got. And let's go ahead and tackle that and try to make those changes. Um, and so they can see firsthand, you know, how these systems can work and what it's going to take to actually do this, this kind of, uh, of work. And then that starts to make the changes. And, and then I also see that once farmers become successful, their neighbors start to pay attention. The resistance becomes less. And it starts that momentum shift. Um, so... It's just going to take, I think, having a number of those farmers being pioneers going out there, making those changes. Everybody else is going to start to pay attention. Um, and then we'll see that ball rolling. And that's really kind of what's happening right now in the field. I'm seeing a lot of, of hey, I'm a neighbor of so-and-so, or I've talked to this farmer, um, and he's had some success. Can tell me more, right? And, and that's where I think the big change is going to make. And then once we get that, then there'll, I think, be a much quicker adoption of these practices. Um, and we'll be able to convert a lot more land a lot faster. One of the things that I hear a lot in the United States is um, what people call the coffee shop conversation, where kind of like what Elaine was describing, um, but for farmers, you know, they've made a change, they've planted maybe a diverse cover crop. So there's all these things there that aren't corn or soy, and they go into the coffee shop and everybody starts talking about them very rudely. Um, and um, saying, oh, look at that, you know, they're so messy and what do they think they're doing? Who do they think they are? Uh, and especially in small rural communities, those relationships are really important. And so um, figuring out ways, for me, I think one of the key things that has made this work in India and that, has, that is working in other places is people who have figured out how to have a long-term learning network, a long-term learning community of people who can support each other, are interested in listening to each other, and can define their own questions and figure out ways to, to research them. That's what the farmer field school approach is, which um, isn't used much in the US, but is used in many other parts of the world. And um, holistic management support groups do that. Um, at Land and Leadership, we're working on long-term long -term communities of learning. Um, that's part of what that does is it breaks us out of that paradigm of relying on experts as if somebody who's over here who's not working with your farm knows about you know knows more than you do about your farm or about your area or your context so i think i think a lot of this is about building strong relationships between people so that they um feel more supported in their innovation. They know that if things, you know, if something doesn't work out, they have people to talk to about it. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up, Dee Dee. And it's like something I love as well to see those farmer to farmer sharing situations. Um, I, Stefan, I don't want to get you in trouble, but I'm so curious if you've presented your research to traditional animal science professors at land grant institutions and what their reaction was. Yeah, no, uh, we have uh, presented that. And uh, I mean, I get a com comment such as like, uh, you know, thank you for challenging the, 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 the status quo or, or presenting this information, right? So I think, but I think people are open for the idea. And, uh, you know, certainly sort of these nature-based solutions, that field is growing, right? And uh, we're also not per se saying, and it's not realistic, right? Uh, to say, well, we're gonna stop finishing in feeds laws and things like that, right? So we are just, I mean, it's a, it's a way of bringing it in a diplomatic way. So I think, you know, people are open for it, but yeah, I mean, changing the status quo is always gonna be baby steps. But uh, um, I see many farmers 
making the transition because it's beneficial for them because they cut back their input costs with like 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a year. So maybe they're not producing more, but they're producing a similar amount, but they cut back their costs so much. And as a result, they improve profitability and quality of life. And uh, uh, I think we absolutely need to support small to mid uh, skill farmers. And that is what we're focusing on. But it, it, we should, that doesn't mean we cannot have the big sort of, you know, industrial food system either. I mean, I think there's a combination of both. So uh, uh, it's finding sort of a, a middle ground in that, I think. Oh, thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, that's, um, that's kind of the thing I've been talking about a lot lately is the messy middle between a lot of what's out there and the fact that we don't necessarily want to set it up as a fight between sides, but we want to say, you know, that it, not that the truth is always a, an average of two extremes, but that there is a kind of like a mosaic that we can pull and put together from some different things. And it's not going to work the same way everywhere, especially in terms of, you know, different countries and, and the food systems that they have. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for fighting that fight in the land grant system. Uh, I, you know, I still am um, doing some publishing, but that guy got a little, a little tired of <laughs> Edwin's. <laughs> Yeah. So I think we're, Brian, we're probably going to have to to shut yep. things down here just because we're over time, but um, we wanted to put up our, our um, marketing promo one last time here and then, uh, and then thank the panelists for their time today. Um, it's been really great. I've learned um, so much from all of you and I'm really looking forward to attending um, the next webinar, which will be on April the 14th can see that we have a, a series um, set up here. And so, yeah, but I just echo the, the comments coming through on chat that I'm glad people are finding. It's so inspiring to hear from these voices across the, um, you know, sort of alternative um, agricultural spectrum. And, um, and we want to, it's so great that here at the Soul Food Web School, we can, we can bring people together um, to share these advances. All right. Was anything, any, any, anybody's like heart heavy to share one last thing? <laughs> I have one last thing to share about your question, Adam. I think talking about the land grant, you know, the power is with the farmers and the community and the consumers. If they change, we will change too as land grants, right? I love it. We are focusing on that instead. Oh, thank you so much for that. That makes me feel optimistic. And I still am, am maintaining so many relationships along across university systems. And I, I can't wait to be part of helping it change. It's a little bit of different uh, attitude, I think, from younger folks, because over the last 15 years, started to see a shift uh, in the people that are being hired by land, land grant universities. So there's been more willingness to look at um, studies that have been done that don't line up with the, uh, you know, the way we were in the 1970s and 60s, for example. So the freeze is uh, starting to melt and we're getting more people into land grant universities that will pay attention, that they'll at least do studies. Um, they're willing to um, add the important material into their lectures. So the change is happening. It's been mm -hmm. a long time a brewing. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's sign off here so that people can get about um, their daily activities. But I just wanted to thank all the panelists one more time. And I know Dan had to leave already um, for a personal reason. It's great to be here and really, really um, fun, fun, even if a bit distracting to read the chat. There's just so many great comments and yes. questions. And, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, we are, we, are, we are building the community right here. And um, yeah, looking forward to meeting some of you in the next course. And I want to thank um, all of the support people who have, behind the scenes have made it possible for us to um, put on these kinds of webinars. And, you know, so uh, Sammy and Alex and Heather and Luke and uh, everybody back there, please our, take our um, uh, gratitude for, for the effort you put in. 
Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. Our essential, well, our essential workers and David yep. and Ignacio. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> awesome. We'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Ciao. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos. Thank you.